G-L-E-S Eagles Football Friday here on Burns 365. Joe Krause back in the chair today uh, and yesterday. So it's a two-day stint for Krause here with uh, John McMullen on Burns 365 presented by Jaguar Land Rover of Willow Grove. Johnny Mack, a good Friday morning to you, sir. How are you? I'm doing well. Good to see you, Krause. Uh, we we even got a little Eagles movement to celebrate to Football Friday, getting a potential backup tight end in C.J. Uzama, veteran. Yeah, the t- uh, the tight end room on the roster um, is filled with interesting pronunciations uh, yeah, yeah. For, for some of the last names. I need to phonetically be able to write it out so I can properly, um, uh, pr- properly, um, yeah, say everybody the name. gives up. It's funny. Everybody gives up with certain people, Albert, uh, Gwegbanon, everybody gives up on. So they just call him Albert. O. and if you go back to the Super Bowl season, my favorite Halapuli Bati Baitai, all the Eagles would just call him big B because they didn't want to try to figure it out. Uh, but yeah, some interesting CJ uh, comes in, as you mentioned, with Albert Agwegbanan. And don't forget, Noah Tungiai is still here. So it is quite the hurdle to pronounce the uh, uh, Jason Michael is the tight ends coach. He's probably got uh, that's that's job description number one to figure out how to say everybody's name. Uh, John, d- d- one year deal comes in on a one year deal, obviously, you know. He's got to perform. Tell them, what do you know? You know, what do you know about him? He's got a tenure and got a got a long tenure in the NFL. I think his career is probably without knowing the numbers, you know, tailed down. You know, he's on the downward in terms of production. But what kind of player is he? What do you know about? Him? Yeah, at his height in Cincinnati, he's a pretty good player. Um, and then he signed a pretty big free agent deal with the Jets. Um He's 31, mm-hmm. so that's not typical the way the Eagles want to go. But this is obviously just a, a short-term potential a- answer. Very big guy, 6'5", 265-ish. So he's more of an old-school tight end that's going to play in line. Um, in theory, maybe a little bit more. Um, uh, it maybe can offer a little bit more than Jack Stoll would do in that blocking sort of role as the backup tight end. Um, And that enables you to uh, use Dallas Goddard in the slot as a flex player more. You you don't need him in line as much if it works out, if he's got anything left. You know, this league moves quickly, I would say. He is 31, going on 32, Um, didn't play well. Um, didn't live up to the contract he signed with the Jets. So, um, but, uh, you know, if he can recover in limited snaps, obviously, as a backup tight end to what he was in Cincinnati at the end there, that's a, that's a pretty solid upgrade for a, for a veteran team. But you have to wait and see how much he's got left. And, and I'm sure from the contract standpoint, look, he'll be brought in to compete and I always talk about draft proofing the roster. The Eagles need a backup tight end. They need to figure out who it's going to be. It still might be Grand Calcaterra. It still might be Albert O. Um, but CJ Uzama is a more proven option. He's played a lot of football, understands how to play. Um, and if he's got anything left uh, for a team that considers itself a contender, it's not a bad one year flyer. Think of it. You know, when they brought in LeGarrette Blunt at running back during the Super Bowl season or Chris Long or somebody like that, uh, you know, 
that's what you're hoping for with with a CJ Uzama. Can he catch? Is he is he a better catcher than a uh, than he is a blocker? How does he? How do you see? No, him he's definitely in? more of a blocker. But he but he's you know he's caught the football uh, over the years as well. So he offers more. He's not going to scare anybody down the seam. Um, you know, like like Dallas will with his athleticism or some George Kittle or some of the big time, um, some of the big time receivers, but he, 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 you know, he's not like you look at Jack Stoll as the comp as the comp because he was the backup tight end. He's going to offer you more than that. He caught, you know, his high, his high watermark in Cincinnati was 49 receptions. You know, so he'll catch the ball, and he had five touchdowns in 2021. He'll catch the ball uh, if it's thrown to him, but he's not. You know, he's definitely more of a blocker, more of an old school tight end. As I said, six five. You don't see six six five. And actually, I'm looking at him listed as six six two seventy. You you don't see those guys anymore. That's like 1980s tight ends. So. Um, you know, in the blocking game, the running game, as we talked about, we're constantly talking about how much Saquon Barkley is going to help, you know, having a blocking tight end to only increases things as you try to maybe up, upgrade the effectiveness of the running game, which I know fans at Philadelphia will enjoy if they can do that. John, if you assume, or if you, well, I guess you would. Would you assume it to be an upgrade from Stoll or just a replacement for the number two tight end in, in, in the in the offense? Well, the hope is it's an up again, you know, the biggest issue here in, in his prime, yeah, no question, much better player than Jack Stoll. Uh how much does he have left at 31? Um, is the question. He didn't play well last season. The Jets ended up uh cutting him. But the Jets have some pretty good tight ends. Uh, uh, Tyler Conklin, uh, Rucker, they, they drafted Jeremy Rucker. They drafted a couple years ago. So, you know, when he, he signed a, a three-year, $24 million deal with the Jets. So that was a pretty big deal at the time. That's what he was coming off two big seasons in, in Cincinnati. And their Super Bowl run where he caught 15 catches in the playoffs. So... He was showing up in the playoffs as well. Um, so he can catch the football. He's a very good blocker, uh, much more accomplished than Jack Stoll ever was. If he's got something left, you know, the assumption is everybody stays, and I say this all the time, some kind of stasis in the NFL. <laughs> it doesn't happen like that. Guys will drop off a quick cliff quickly. So it doesn't hurt bringing him in to compete with a bunch of other guys. And by the way, it doesn't limit the Eagles or prevent the Eagles from taking a tight end in the draft if they like one. But again, it 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 lessens the need for one. So if you're there day three and say, we got to get a tight end, you don't really have to say that probably any longer. You probably have enough competition to say, it might be Calcaterra, it might be Albert O, it might be CJ, but somebody of that three should be able to, you know, do enough in, in August to say they're a valuable backup tight end in the NFL. I mean, you definitely and obviously have a better perspective on this than than I do and probably most of our um, uh, Birds 365 uh, viewers in the stream or who are watching us on the Jacob Sports YouTube channel uh, do as well. But um, are the signings that the Eagles have made so far, do they do more of them fall into that category of we'll see if they have anything left or we'll see if their career can come back to what it was? Or am I just missing the point no it's always a mix um obviously the eagles have bet heavily on bryce huff they bet heavily on saquon barkley saquon, obviously right even to a certain degree cj um gardner johnson with a three-year deal 
Um, and then, you know, there's always levels. Matt Hennessy is a good player, at least developing into a good player in Atlanta as a, a starting center, starting guard. Um, and, and injuries took over and, and he had some knee issues and, you know, you're kind of rolling the dice there that he'll stay healthy and, and, and be a, a solid interior backup. Devin, Devin White's probably the best example, you know, one year, $4 million deer deal, essentially um, former number five overall pick in the draft. Um, you know, that's a lottery ticket, so to speak. Um but he's expected to start, so he's a little bit more important, or at least as we talk today, and it, we'll see what the Eagles do in the draft at linebacker. Um, guy like CJ's a back, you know, he's being brought in to be a backup player. Bonte Maddox, you know, they bring him back on a one-year deal um, as, uh, you know, crossing his fingers, crossing their fingers to hope he stays healthy. So, Paris Campbell, and I, I would say is that, you know, and I go back to that 27 season because 2017 season because it worked so well for Howie Roseman with LeGarrette Blunt and Chris Long and Patrick Robinson, maybe even the best of the three and doesn't get the credits, uh, turned into probably the best nickel back in football that year. Um, those one-year deals that hit – as potential contributors, that's what you want from Devin White and Avante Maddox and Matt Hennessy and CJ Uzama. Are they all going to hit and be contributors? You know, no, probably not. Probably not. That's true for any team. Yeah, exactly. that's true. True for any team. True for any team uh, signing fourteen days or thirteen days out from uh, the NFL draft. Uh, we talked yesterday. We'll talk a little bit more today, I'm sure, as Bob Brookover <laughs> is scheduled for 920 today uh, on the AM side. Uh, so, I thought so it was we, PM. That was, I, I think that was my fault in hindsight, but we'll see. I thought Bob knew it was a morning show, but, you know, I, I – Maybe my ego's too big, Krause, and I assume people know what the show is on. Hey, I will tell you this. We got some great feedback yesterday uh, from uh, the ability for the engaged audience to uh, ask a few questions uh, uh, of John McMullen. So um, as the show moves into year four, as Birds 365 goes into uh, uh, into year four and <clears throat> My this chair that I'm sitting in for the last two days is replaced, and uh, we move into the new era of Birds 365. John, we might have to occasionally uh, incorporate uh, that that segment of Ask John. I think people appreciated the ability to ask you directly uh, some thoughts and some questions. I'm sure they want your perspective on the draft too. We might have to do some. We might have to do some mock drafts leading up to a, leading up to the draft on 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 the 25th. Uh, some do, some don't, Krause. You know, you got. Uh, but yeah, if you're respectful, I have no problem answering answering the question. But you know, we also have, unfortunately, some trolls in there. But you got to you got to pick through. You got to pick through. Eight twenty. Paul D Adamo will be with us as well. So two good guests today for uh, our version of Football Friday. When I got the show yesterday, John, I'm thinking, uh, just thinking about the conversation, listening to uh, your comments <clears throat> on Saquon Barkley and and how he fits into the offense and um, or how they potentially will use him and what that means. And then I'm thinking about. <clears throat> A.J. Brown and, and, and your reference to him by far being the best talent, uh, you know, on this offensive side. And I'm saying to myself, this team is loaded. This team really is loaded. So, and essentially. Offensively. Offensively. Off offensively. So, <clears throat> essentially, Saquon Barkley is now – an upgrade to an offensive team or an offensive unit that was already loaded the previous season, <clears throat> which makes that 
that drop off hard to hard to understand. And then I think to myself, okay, well, they bring CJ back on defense and, and, and so with Fangio in there now, the defense, and you said it yesterday, the defense is going to be a top 15 or top 16 defense in the league. So, which sounds great. So now I'm I'm thinking to myself, where is the roadblock from preventing this team to dominate? in the upcoming 24 season, if they're better on offense by potentially what could be a lot, if Saquon Barkley. I don't know how much they can get better on offense. That's my concern. Mm -hmm. Um, And I bring it up all the time with, with Miles Sanders. I mean, a couple years ago. So over the past two seasons, the Eagles Mm -hmm. have had pro bowl running backs um, and, you know, that's more a testament to the offensive line and, and Jalen Hurts's um presence on the field as a plus one in the running game. Um, but the bottom line is they were able to throw out Miles Sanders and get twelve hundred and sixty-nine yards from him, four point nine yards per carry, um, and and get him to the Pro Bowl. Is he a Pro Bowl running back? Well, he wasn't in Carolina, so that tells you the difference. Um Last year, DeAndre Swift <clears throat> had three seasons in Detroit, average player, never sees the, the mantle as the lead back. He comes here, he's got over 1,000 yards, makes the Pro Bowl 4.6 yards per carry. And that's kind of been the mentality of the Eagles and why they devalued the position. So they sort of did the 180 and said, well, this guy's special. That's the term how we use. This guy's special. This guy's different. He certainly was in 2018 coming out of Penn State in his first year with the Giants. And this is where I want to talk with, with Brookie about this in an hour, too, because he covered the Giants before he came back to Philly. So <clears> he's got a, a very good feel for Saquon. Tremendous talent nobody questions that tremendous guy tremendous leader nobody questions that but he's touched the football 1500 times on a bad team on bad turf and we've seen the history of this league with running backs and how they sort of degrade pretty quickly when you get up to that number and that level of touches even though on paper he's not that old um, because he came into the league very young, um, but he's got a lot of a lot of work under um, under the cover, so to speak. So, my question on Saquon Barkley is simply: is again to a to an even de- greater greater degree when you talk about veteran players who played a lot. <clears throat> um, how much does he have left? Is he the same guy? To me, clearly. Now, you also throw the injuries in, Torres ACL, hasn't been the same guy. And then the MetLife Turf, which you talk to every player, they hate playing there. And it's not about injuries, it's about the wear and tear. I talk to Slay all the time. Darius Slay doesn't even like practicing in the Eagles bubble because it destroys his body from a, a wear and tear standpoint. So... Those are my questions with Saquon Barkley, um, and 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 we'll see how it how it works out. But the Eagles have described him; they're on record. How he's on record, special, and he's going to provide a presence for the offense that didn't exist before. And we'll see if it works out. Well, that presence and that one eighty degree switch by Howie. Tells me they're going to use them a lot. Mm. And then that, well, I don't know if they are, if they, I believe they're going to use them a lot. And I believe that's going to change a little bit of the, of the dynamic of the offense, but it still even elevates even more. This offense is loaded, John. This offense on, should on, dominate on, every on paper, game. on paper, it looks good, but you have tremendous <clears> pressure as well on Nick Sirianni. Ani, obviously, because he looks to people on the outside as a lame duck coach, but also Kellen Moore, because Kellen Moore's got to figure out 
how to get the football to all these guys and how to keep everybody happy. Um, and as Nick says, that's a good problem to have. But as I always say, when you use that term, good problem, the word problem mm. still exists in that phrase. It is a problem to keep everybody engaged, involved, and happy. All right. Well, hopefully Nick, Nick lets Kellen do his job and stays the CEO uh, and stays poor, out of the Poor stay, Nick. The head stays coach. out of the play calling. Stay out of the way, Nick. Poor stay Nick. out of the way. Stand right. there, pump your chest out, and say, look, I'm the CEO of the football team and let everything else unfold in front of you. On the other side of our first break here on uh, Birds 365, year four, Damo will jump on, uh, jump in the two box and uh, John McMullen and Paul will uh, have a great conversation. I'll be back on the other side of that interview as we go to our first break. Uh, a reminder about our good friends from Del Val Insurance. Don't forget a reminder to call Fran uh, or Jim up at Del Val Insurance uh, a great partner of ours. Uh, the tagline for them from them is real. Save up to 40% uh, on your car insurance. Call Del Val Insurance today at 215-354-0122. My name is uh, Fran Solano. I'm a managing director here at Del Val Insurance Group. Been in the business for over 36 years, saving people money on their insurance needs. Give us a call. Let us help you custom design an insurance plan that meets both your needs and budget. Imagine for a moment that you went to work today and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was going to be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was going to be all right just by talking with Brian. In my heart, I just knew everything was going to be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Champions on three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA and the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. And the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC <laughs> Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. Eagles. 
Welcome back, Birds 365, a football Friday edition, and that means our buddy Paul Domowich. Domo in the house. Good to see you, Domo. Um, I, I saw you pop in the uh, the green room as Joe Krause and I were talking there, and and I you probably heard Joe say Nick Sirianni's got to get out of the way. I just shake my head, boy, man. This this city's tough. We, I just got done talking to Fletcher, uh, making his retirement official. He mentioned it three times, how tough it is to play in this city. You need a thick skin, and Fletcher did it very well for a very long time. But I, that's the first thing I thought of when Nick Sirianni's got to get the hell out of the way, Dama. Is that your uh, your take on the head coach of this football team, get out of the way? No, I, I think there's a little bit more involved than that for him. <laughs> Um, you know, nobody says that about Andy Reid. I mean, I, 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 Andy Reid isn't calling the plays in Kansas City. Uh, he's basically a CEO coach right now as well. Uh, and yet, you know, he's going to the Hall of Fame. So, no, I I, I think, uh, you know, uh, I think Nick's uh, still got a lot to do with, with how that team's going to do this year. I mean, they had the eighth-ranked offense in the NFL <clears throat> last year. Now, look, the expectations were what they were. And it was a little bit disappointing. And 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 they certainly collapsed down the stretch. They collapsed everywhere. Um, they were actually better in third down offense in 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 last season they than they were during the Super Bowl season and better in fourth down off. Now a lot of that has to do with the tush push, but nonetheless, you're better in certain aspects. You still have a 1,500-yard receiver. You still have a second 1,000-yard receiver. They seem to be able to turn anybody into a Pro Bowl running back, and now they have Saquon Barkley. Um, It was a pretty good offense last year. When you take a step back and get away from the emotion of the collapse, why do you think so many people can't recognize that? Well, I I think those last five, six games kind of – overshadowed uh, and, and the playoffs overshadowed everything else they accomplished in that 10 and one start. Um, you know, the offense kind of just like the defense at the end, uh, I think their, their average yards uh, uh, points per game when, went down nearly a touchdown. Uh, I think they only averaged 20 something, 20, 20 uh, point something a, uh, a game in those last five regular season games. And in the playoffs, we saw, you know, how that worked with the, with Tampa Bay. So I, I think that's just – that's kind of what happened here. I mean, even – you know, I remember watching that 10-1 and one start. And, you, and, you know, everybody was – you'd find fault and everybody would say, well, what, you know, they're winning. You know, they're winning ugly, but they're winning. But there were things you could see that ended up kind of uh, – Yeah. Even in at the end. But you're right. Their third down offense was better. They were, you know, they were okay in the red zone. Uh, you know, jail, I mean, you know, but, J, you know, Jalen at the end uh, kind of fell apart. His overall numbers from the year before were down. I mean, he had a, what, last year, I think he only had a plus eight touchdown to interception ratio, um, you know, more interceptions than he's ever thrown, things like that. So, but anyway, getting back to your original question, Sean, I just think that those last five games in the regular season plus the playoffs kind of just uh, overshadowed yeah. everything else. Recency bias, which is natural. But I, I will say this about the playoff game. And you can go back to 2021 when the Eagles surprised us all, made the run, made the playoffs, also lost in Tampa Bay. They had some good games offensively, some bad games. Where they turned the corner was draft day of 2022, and that's getting A.J. Brown. And to me, he was the final piece of the puzzle, and everything kind of fit in place with his presence on the field. They didn't have him in that game in Tampa, and they're not very good. Well, I shouldn't say that because they do have some good games, and and but they're not nearly as consistent when A.J.'s not on the field. Luckily, that hasn't happened very often. Right. Um, is it as simple as no AJ? It's going to be a bigger struggle. Well, I mean, your best players have to be on the field or it's going to impact any team. Uh, there's just not a lot of depth at key positions, uh, 
you know, anywhere in the league these days. So, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, they've picked up Barkley. Barkley stays healthy. I mean, this offense is probably going to look terrific this year. <clears throat> Barkley misses six, seven games. Not so much. Yeah, well, you do have Todd Gabe. You do. They, they, but, but that's an underrated. I think everybody kind of turned the page on need at running back. And understandably, when you bring in Saquon Barkley, you go, all right, we're set at running back. But this is the 2024 NFL. You need more than one back. And right yeah. now, they have Kenny Gainwell, Ty Davis Price, Lou Nichols. Babin brought Boston Scott back. I'm a little surprised by that, um, just because he's a good guy in the locker room and he seems to always he seems like a good utility guy, Boston Scott. It's like an old school utility player in baseball, Damo. He plays once every once in a while, you forget about him. But then when he performs, I'm a little surprised he's not back. Maybe will be after the draft if they're not able to uh get some more depth. Um but since we're talking about depth, C.J. Uzama, I'm a little bit surprised. Old school, 6'6", six, 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 260, big inline tight end. He's a pretty good player. At the end of his stint in Cincinnati, got a big deal with the Jets, didn't perform up to that. So there's just nothing left. He is 31. To me, it's got to be an upgrade over Jack Stoll. I, I like the signing. I think it's a valuable sort of lottery ticket signing as a potential backup tight end. Yeah, I mean, I think they want Grant Calcaterra to be their n number two guy. They just don't know whether he can be, whether he can stay healthy, uh, which is why I think they're bringing in guys like uh, Azuma uh, just to, you know, so they have some depth there, let him fight it out in training camp in the preseason. Uh, you know, but if, if, if everybody, you know, if, if Calcaterra can stay healthy, uh, you know, his pass catching ability really intrigues them. And I think, you know, that's the guy they would they would like to see as the number two. But we'll see. I, I always say with, with 12, when you're playing 12, um, you know, you almost, if you have Grant out there um, or even Albert, Albert, oh, Albert Akwegbenam, um, Dallas pretty much has to be the inline guy, right? Whereas if you bring in, stole it previously or in theory cj um uzama here that that enables you to use dallas as the flex tight end and i think that's better in other words i, I think it's better for them to have a a guy who can, who can block <clears throat> and those there's not a lot of those guys now <laughs> i mean there's not a lot of tight ends that can do that um or am i trying to thread the needle too deeply there just, you know, the more yeah. Dallas's receiver, the better. Yeah, I mean, you you would like to have a tight end that, that you know, a little bit like Goddard, uh, you know, as far as being able to block. Uh, they're just, like you said, there aren't a lot of them. Um, I don't think, you know, they, they've never looked terribly hard for one. Uh, I, I And I think this year, uh, you know, you're going to see Hurts get rid of the ball a lot quicker more consistently quicker. Uh, they're going to, I think they're going to concentrate more on an intermediate game than throwing those damn deep balls uh, <laughs> down to AJ Brown and Devante. Uh, so, you know, maybe that uh, getting a blocking tight end isn't as important as getting a guy that can catch the ball. So I was talking to Randy Mueller, the ex GM ex executive of the year in the NFL. And he said something interesting to me that I hadn't thought of, but you know, mm -hmm. he, he did it at a high level when he was talking about Nick Sirianni, because I, I was pretty much on, I, I thought it was crazy when I was flying down to Tampa for the playoff game. I, I thought it was insane to even think about firing Nick Sirianni, even if they lost the game. That was my thought arriving in Tampa after uh, after the game, I was shaken a little bit, mainly because I heard one of the Eagles' foot, top football executives call it effing embarrassing, that loss. Uh, so that stood out to me. Um, 
And I said, boy, that was bad. And Randy said, it's your job as an NFL coach to fix things. And I said, yeah, yeah, you know, that sounds about right. And Nick didn't fix anything down that stretch we were just talking about. Um, and part of it was Jalen Hurts, I think, falling in love with what you just said, the big play. And we go back to the Seattle game when he and AJ sort of went off script um, and said, let's go win the game. They were going to win that game, Tomo. They were moving the football down the field. Just take what Seattle's giving you. You're going to win that game. Or at the bare minimum, you're going to yeah. tie it. Um, and all of a sudden, they take the shot. He throws into double coverage, game over. Seattle wins. He really got enamored with the big play. Is it just as simple as he's going to stop doing that? Was Kellen Moore got some kind of magic powder, sprinkle it on him, say, just take what's there? Because that's a concern. He was just, he doesn't want to deal with that intermediate stuff. Is that a concern to you? Well, I mean, Kellen Moore and Nick are going to have an entire offseason to drill that into uh, Jalen and AJ, uh, who I think is part of the problem. <laughs> you know, he's out there saying, I, I'm going to get open. Just throw me the damn ball. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think Jalen understand will understand going into this season the importance of throwing underneath. I mean, defenses aren't giving you the deep ball anymore. Uh, I mean, he, I know he, he had a lot of success with it for a while last season, uh, more than most quarterbacks in the league. But teams. I mean, if a defense wants to take that away from you, they will. He couldn't accept that last year at the end, and the Seattle game was a perfect example of it. Uh, I think this year he'll have come to the conclusion that we need to, you know, operate differently. I think, you know, I think you'll, that's why I really truly believe you're going to see Barkley catch seventy plus passes this year. Uh, and yeah, I I will not. You know me, Tomo. I will not believe that until I see it. And that's not a crit. People think I criticize Saquon Barkley. He's very capable of catching seventy. Guess what? So was DeAndre Swift. He caught sixty in Detroit, and he didn't play four games. He was very capable of doing it. They just don't do it. Well, the problem they had last year, when you look at the numbers, John. It, it, I mean, they did throw to their backs. I mean, they threw more, a lot more than they did the year before. I forget what what uh, Gainwell and and Swift. Uh, well, yeah, they never threw to Miles, but that well, you know, Miles, that was partially on Miles. Yeah, yeah but they, they threw a lot to them. The problem was, it was it it got nothing. They averaged like five point seven yards per catch when they threw to those two guys, which is totally unacceptable, especially for two guys like that. Who, when you look at their history, I mean, when you look at Gainwell. Earlier in his career, when you look at Swift in Detroit, I mean, Swift averaged like eight yards a, a catch in Detroit one year. I don't know why that – I don't know what, what happened. I don't know you know, how much of that you lay on, on Jalen, how much of it you lay on the offense. But, it, you know, I think that will be different this year with Barkley with, and, and, and Gainwell. I mean, Gainwell's not going to be a, a, a hood ornament on the bench. He's going to be a part of this offense. I mean, no, don't say that to the Eagles fans. They don't like Kenny. Yeah, well, I mean, they're not. They won't like it if, if they overuse Barkley either. And Barkley's, uh, you know, on IR at the end of the season, so uh, yeah. they need to, they need to mix him in. Um, with with, it, I I don't want to get bogged down um, with Saquon because we're going to have uh, your old buddy Bob uh, Brook over on in the second hour and. Bob was covering the Giants before he right. got back to Philadelphia. So I think it will have a good impact on, you know, I, I don't know. Cause I covered Randy Moss early in my career. And my thought is with great players, they're going to find a way. And Fletcher talk, and I want to talk about Fletcher's hall of fame um, candidacy as well. And Fletcher kind of talked about that and said it was D'Amico rides. I asked him the question about, you know, producing no matter what doesn't matter scheme coaching there's certain guys who are just gonna find a way because they're so good and i thought that way about randy um i don't know if i feel that way about saquon the the eagles have used the term special i think he was special in 2018 
But this league moves quickly, Damo. Is he special after 1,500 touches? Yeah. Yeah, I'd say no. Um, so what uh, the expectations, and I think it's about presence, and that to me is more esoteric. Like, to me, it's not about numbers. Like, Jody, I uh, love him as a statistics guy. I'm not a statistics guy. I freely admit it. I don't think football is a game that lends itself towards statistics. Our old buddy Chris Long would talk about sacks. He's like, tell me what they are, you know? Yeah. Is somebody getting pushed up the middle and somebody runs into you? And that's Chris, who's a, a pass rusher, said there's real sacks and there's sort of, but you look at the box score and say, oh, that guy had 10 sacks. Not necessarily great. Is presence enough if he just makes it easier for everybody else? I guess it is because they'll win games, but do you think he needs to put up numbers to justify what the Eagles have done? Well, I mean, I, he needs to put up numbers, but not touches. Uh, I mean, there's two ways you can go when you pick up a guy like this who's a special player, but he's got wear and tear on his on his you know on his tires. If it's a one year, if you, if you want him for one year, you can just run him into the ground and hope he's got that one great year left. And and a, in a lot of cases, in, in if you look back in history, that's worked great for teams sometimes. Uh, They've signed him to a three-year contract, which essentially is a two-year contract, which means they want him around here for two, at least two years. I don't think they want to run him into the ground. Uh, I think they'll be careful with how they use him. That doesn't mean they're going to keep him off the field. Doesn't mean he's not going to be on the field in the red zone, which was a, a what seemed to irritate a lot of pe people uh, with uh, regard to Swift and Gainwell. Um, so I, you know, I think they're going to watch how they use him. Um, you know, I don't, I, and that's why I think you're, you know, you're going to see a lot of him in the passing game because that's not as much wear and tear. You're not taking the hits you are that you're taking between the tackles. So, I mean, I, they're going to use him a lot, but I don't think we're going to see him lead the league in carries, uh, lead the league in, in touches this year. Um, all right, let's talk about Pletch Damo. Um, boy, the more I think about it, and, and you're going to be the one, hopefully, uh, down the road, uh, making the case for Fletcher Cox. The, the more I think about it, I, I think he's a Hall of Fame player. Maybe that's a bias from covering him. Um, I, I, I really do. And I, I heard Adam Schefter say he's a Hall of Fame player. I think that helps, you know, because of Adam's status. But um, I think he had a more traditional career uh, than Jason Kelsey. But I, and I think I told you this before, if you ask me who's the better Eagle, I say Fletcher Cox. Am I crazy? Yeah. Oh, all right. I'm crazy. All right. Yeah, I'll take I, that. No, I mean, you know what? It, I mean, it's easy. It, it, it was easier for offenses to take Fletch out of a game or, or neutralize him with two blockers uh, than, than it would have been to take, you know, Jason out of a game. Uh, but the problem is that when you say that about, when I say that about Fletcher, it's not necessarily his fault. I mean, you put two blockers on him. It means somebody should be getting to the quarterback, should be open, should be able to get through a gap. A lot of times that didn't happen uh, with the other defensive tackle. Um, so I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I think he's a borderline case. I'm not going to say he's, he doesn't belong in the Hall of Fame. I mean, I think he certainly uh, will get considered. I think it'll be a while, though. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be first ballot. And I think people get too hung up on first ballot. I don't even know if Jason will be first ballot. And I, I do think from my per uh, – look, I hate criticizing Jason Kelsey because Jason Kelsey's a Hall of Famer. He's a phenomenal player. It's not even a criticism. I just think at his height, I think Fletcher was a more dominant player. Yeah. But, you know, Jason has the personality and the podcast. And maybe I listen to Jason too much because uh, Jason said there's two players he played with. And I think he understated this because I think Lane should be in the conversation. I think AJ should be in the conversation. But Jason said there's two players he played with 
um, that would have been successful regardless of what I was talking about with Saquon, scheme, coaching, um, supporting cast, whatever. Yeah. Jason Peters, Fletcher Cox. That's it. Um, like I said, I think if he thought about it more, he might say Lane, he might say AJ. There's a, there's a few more, but that that's what he said. And he'll tell you Fletcher's a better player, but you know, he might be self deprecating and yeah. I might be putting too much onto that. I did hear Aaron Donald speak glowingly about Jason Kelsey. Um, and that holds a lot of weight for me. By the way, Kelsey spoke glowingly of Aaron Donald as well. Um, so it's really close. They're both great players. They're both obviously Eagles Hall of Famers. But I do think if you give Fletcher Jason's personality, he's got more cachet, I guess, with the Eagles fans. I think it, in some weird way he's underrated. I guess, you know, sometimes the, you see too much of a guy and it, it you don't appreciate him as much. Uh, you know, I, 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 that might be the case with me and, and Fletch. I mean, when I look at his career, I, you know, I, I look at a, when I look at a guy who I'm considering for the Hall of Fame, I want to see multiple great years. He made an all-decade team, Damo. That's I big. Know, yeah, I know he did. Uh, those de all-decade teams are voted – are as flawed as, as the written. Oh, yeah, I, I agree. But um, they seem to hold weight. Fletcher in 2018, there was him and Aaron Donald, nobody close. And I kept waiting for, okay, you know, this is, this is what's going to put him in the hall of fame. He's going to have three more of these years. And he didn't, he was okay. He was better than okay, but he, he was not a great all pro player uh, in his last five years. He was just a, a very competent, Big and an important part of that offense, a uh, defense, but he wasn't he wasn't Aaron Donald. He wasn't close to Aaron Donald, and I guess that's kind of influenced my thinking right now. I mean, he had great, he had very good years leading up to 2018. I mean, both in a in the three four that Billy Davis played, uh, and and the four threes he played in. I mean, he was a consistently big part of that defense. I just uh, whether he's a Hall of Famer, that's that that's a case. You know that it'll take some. I think it's it'll. I need to. Yeah, I, I agree. It'll it'll take some time. Um, and I, I by no means, and I, I don't even know if Jason's going to get in first ballot because it's it's historically yeah. been difficult for centers. Uh, at least they have to wait a little bit. But I think uh, Jason's so high profile. Yeah. You know, and that wrestle only... that WrestleMania stint might put him over the hump. I think there's only 10 centers in the, in all. Yeah, of John nobody. Somewhere nobody. around that number. Uh, and, you know, like you said, you, I mean, look at this year. <clears throat> Antonio Gates didn't get in. Yeah, that's he crazy. Will, he will next year. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Andre Johnson kind of uh, beat him out. Um, another pass catcher, maybe not a tight end. But uh, so, I mean, that first in, – in football, that first year, you know, that first ballot thing – is, is is it's apples and oranges when you compare that to baseball. I yeah. mean, Jason will get in early. Uh, uh, my guess is his second year, maybe. Uh, but uh, you know, you, you can't. It wouldn't surprise me if he, did, like you said, if he didn't get in his first year. Yeah, and you're right because in baseball, you just need what is it, seventy percent? So it can yeah. be a hundred guys. If it, it doesn't if, matter what those yeah. other hundred guys get, as yeah. long as you get your seventy percent. And uh, you guys have a limit, so that affects things as well. Um, but yeah, there's going to be a lot of this talk in years coming up because I think I think Lane's going to be in the conversation to be a Hall of Fame player. We'll see how long he keeps going. So I guess I'll end it there. The draft uh, with you uh, at P Damo. Make sure you follow Paul on X. Twitter does a tremendous job with the thirty third team. Um, WBCB Sports as well uh, during the season. You can listen to them there. Um, and the book, the book, uh, uh, not not um, Sam Mills. What What is your next book? Sam Mills. It is Sam. Yeah. All right. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Do we have a time frame on that yet, Dama? We, Do we, we know. know. I've just we started don't. writing it. So, uh, All right. Probably so before the, uh, sometime... I would guess the summer of 2025. 
So just keep it in the back of your mind, though. Uh, Costamo does a tremendous job and uh, obviously was a big part of Sam getting in the Hall of Fame. So uh, very good insight there. But when it comes to the draft, it's interesting to me because if you look at the value of this draft in, in 22, where the Eagles will start, and mm-hmm. by the way, recent history says how he's not going to pick there. Uh, he might move up. He might move down. He might trade it for another A.J. Brown. <laughs> um, but if, they, if they're if they forced to pick a 22, there's so many good offensive mm-hmm. tackles. But the Eagles have Lane Johnson and Jordan Mailata. And they just gave Jordan another $60 million contract. Lane has indicated he wants to play at least two more years. Um, do you just pull the trigger and say, all right, we'll wait. I mean, Lane's not going to be around forever. Um, or do you, do you force something else um, and go at a different position? I don't think Howie will force anything. Uh, I mean, he may, like you said, he may move down, uh, may move up. Uh, but offensive line wise, you know, I mean, they could, they could get somebody and, and plug him in a guard for a tackle that that they ultimately see as as Lane's replacement. They can play right guard for a, a couple of years if Tyler Steen uh, can't cut it. Um, yeah. By the way, Tyler Steen played tackle in college. Not as yeah. easy. You can't. Now it's different. He was the 65th pick, and yeah. in theory, you you're getting a player with better traits, but. Easier said than done to just say, all right, move in, play right guard, and then kick out uh, and and replace Lane Johnson. Yeah. A lot of these guys have played both, though. uh, Some of the guys that will be available to them that have some guard experience or or maybe – and, 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 you know, even even taking a guy that you ultimately see as an interior lineman long term. I mean, it's not like it's a position that's not important. You know what? I was thinking about trading. I, I want to trade down if I'm forced to pick a 22. And Graham Barton from Duke, that's the guy I think they should take. Get down to 31 or 32 and take that kid um, because I think he's going to be a starting. He can play center. He can play either guards position. And if you have Cam Jurgens, Landon Dickerson, and somebody like that, I think bang. You're off and running. That's a day one starter. But interior offensive line in the first round, that doesn't seem very Howie-ish. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, right now, I mean, they've got to they've got to react uh, because they need they need corners, they need an edge rusher, and and they need offensive line depth. So, I mean, I think they're going to see what happens in front of them and make their decision whether they move up, down, stay where they are, and take one of those positions. Um, so I, it's, you know, I've never had much luck, uh, predicting what, how he's going to do with his first round pick. No, I, nobody. I don't expect that to change this year. And maybe a trade, maybe a trade. Everybody's talking about Patrick Sertan. I would make that trade in a second. I would give Denver the 22nd pick and probably some, you'll probably have to add something yeah. in, but I don't get it from Denver's perspective. Why, why do you want to trade again? And if they do, I think Denver is getting a quarterback. I think they would want yeah. to trade him to get a quarterback. And obviously the Eagles aren't in that equation where they could help them with that no. type of thing. No, but maybe, you know, maybe you would use that as part of a package. Yeah. If you're Denver, couple moves to move up and get one of those uh, quarterbacks or, yeah. I mean, I mean, I think five guys, five quarterbacks are going in that first round. So, and I think maybe four in the first four picks. So, uh, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see what Denver's. Denver's All right, I lied. Since you got five quarterbacks going, I got one more for you, Damo. Of those five quarterbacks, how many are going to be good quarterbacks in the NFL? History says less than half. Yeah, 40%. I agree. With yeah, so if you if you got you know, I mean, I, I could see, and I think I saw Dar- Daniel Jeremiah agrees. He's got four going in the first four picks. Uh, I think that's probably yeah. likely, and I, I bet you two of them are flops or at least never pan out to be the players their teams hope they'll be. Yeah. And I often wonder in 99, I always say, I think I saw, and I cannot remember. And I tried to look for it because I want to give him credit, but they said, we all know Caleb Williams is going number one. And, and, and 
the analyst said, Who, who's going to be the second best quarterback? And he said, whoever lands in Minnesota, because it's more about the situation. And he said, Kevin O'Connell's a good coach. You're going to have Jefferson. You're going to have Jordan Addison. You're going to have TJ Hawkinson for that particular quarterback. And I said, that's pretty smart. You know, it, it the situation, whether it was Tim Couch or Achilles Smith, I often wonder if they landed with Andy Reid, their careers would have been better. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I remember, you know, I've talked to Andy a lot of times about his decision to take McNabb with that second pick. Second, right? Yeah. yeah second. Yeah. You know, why, why Donovan over some of those other guys? And uh, I mean, a big part of that was that he felt McNabb and you could argue that whether this was ended up being the case, but that Donovan, being from Chicago, being a pretty smart guy, Syracuse, I think he was a communications major, that he could handle Philadelphia, that he was the right guy. Yeah, I don't know if he handled Philadelphia, but exactly. he was a great quarterback. You could he wonder, got that but, right. Yeah, but I mean that's why he didn't take the the guy that went to uh, that went to Minnesota. Um, Dante Culpepper, Culpepper. Who, who actually played pretty well until he got injured. That Dante had one of the great seasons of all time from yeah. a statistical standpoint. So he he actually hit as well. I think it was Achille. So it went Tim Couch, Donovan, then Achille Smith. I think Cade McNown was the fourth one, right. and then Dante right. was the fifth one. And Dante was actually the second best, but. And then he had a, just a horrific knee injury, and that was uh, that was pretty much uh, the end of it for him. But it's always good reminiscing with Paul Domowicz because I love history. I love the history of this game, and nobody knows it better than you. Um, and yeah, I'm going to start you early on Fletch. Get him in there. I think yeah. You know, now Fletch is surly sometimes, so I don't know if he's going to turn into a Sante Samuel, and he's going to lobby you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to lobby you for uh, Fletch to, to get him in there, Tom. Well, Asante started like five years before his career was over. Well, yeah, he's smart. He's starting, <laughs> he's starting early. Uh, the great Paul Domowicz. Thanks, Domo. Thanks for having me, John. Good yep. talking to you. Uh, more Birds 365, a football Friday edition after the break. Imagine for a moment that you went to work today, and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was going to be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was going to be all right just by talking with Brian in my heart. I just knew everything was going to be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Champions on three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA. And the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN.
Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. And the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC <laughs> Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. Jumping back in here on Birds 365 with... Uh, John McMullen coming up at 920. Johnny Mack will have Bob Brook over from NJ.com. Uh, and, John, I guess that uh, you'll get into a little bit more conversation uh, about the draft. And then I know uh, in anticipation of Bob uh, joining yesterday, which moved to today, um, you'll have an opportunity to dig a little deeper with him uh, on Saquon Barkley, which um, – I'll look forward to listening to that conversation. I'm still trying to process and figure out, not as an expert, but just as an opinion. I'm just trying to figure out uh, what Kellen Moore uh, is going to bring to this offense or how is he going to utilize Saquon Barkley and how much better will this offense be when they already are or were in 2023 loaded with talent. Yeah, I, I think it has more to do uh, with Jalen Hurts than anybody else. Um, because I think if you look at the, the so-called downgrade from number three, uh, which is what they were in offense during the Super Bowl season, and number eight last season, when they were better in certain situations, uh, third downs, fourth downs, red zone, they were still very good. Uh, top 10, uh, not better, but they're still very good in situational football. Um, I think the downtick in the play from Jalen Hurts was the the biggest issue because she still had the consistency of uh, A.J. Brown, 1,500, 1,500, still the consistency of – Devontae Smith. I do think Dallas Goddard had a bit of a down year, um, at least from a consistency standpoint, from what he typically offers. And he also missed a number of games, but he did the previous season as well. Um, and then DeAndre Swift replacing Miles Sanders. In theory, he had a, a more at least well-rounded running back because Miles didn't help you at all in the passing game. Um, DeAndre could, but they didn't use him enough in that part of it. And I think that translates back to the quarterback as well because I, I don't think Jalen likes throwing it to the backs or – you know, when it comes to those dump offs, when you go from progression one, progression two, then dump it off to the back, um, Jalen Hurts will go from progression one to progression two or whatever it is, and then hold, you know, try to extend the player, take off running it. By the way, I think that's a strength of his game. I think that's what he should be doing. Um, so I think his sort of uh, drop back and play was the issue. And I think Damo talked about they fell in love with the big play. And I think that not only permeated um, with the quarterback and certainly AJ, um, also with the coaching staff, I thought they got enamored with the big play. And sometimes – Sometimes you got to hit a single, stop swinging for the fences, Krause. And I think the Eagles too often were swinging for the fences with that big play instead of, instead of taking what was there and the defenses were giving them. Because the adjustment from defenses around the league, 
after the Eagles had the great uh, 2022 season was, all right, we're going to take away these big plays and we're going to force you to incrementally go down the field. And I think the Eagles were too impatient a lot of the times and too unwilling to just do that. Uh, at least not all the time, but too often. Does the change in 23, because he had Steichen through the 2022 season and then went to Brian Johnson in 23, now he's going to go in 24 to a new offensive coordinator. Um, does the fall in 23, even though eighth isn't bad, no, no, it's not. You usually don't get fired. Yeah. You have the eighth ranked offense in the NFL, but yeah. So, th but, but does, does that fault or that change in Jalen um, land at Brian Johnson's door when he was the offensive coordinator last year? Well, a lot of people, I mean, clearly he was scapegoated. Um, did he deserve to be scapegoated? I don't think so, but. That's the way of the world. I, I mean, but he called, he controlled John, the offense. He controlled the play calling. He inputted the, he created the game plan and he controlled everything around that offense last year. Yes. No, uh, okay. it was Nick's offense, Nick's game plan. And then, you know, he called the plays, um, and that's the way Nick wanted it. And that's the way it was when Shane was here um, as well. Uh, it was still Nick's offense. He had the final say in the game planning. He had the final say in the, in the play calling. Um, now, he certainly had more trust in Shane Steichen because those two have been close probably. Um, not They've been close for a number of years. So he, he the probably part is, he, he, he probably had more trust in Shane Steichen. Brian Johnson was um, somebody he, he just got to know when he arrived in Philadelphia, so there wasn't that long history. There was the long history with Brian and, and Jalen Hurts, but not with the head coach previously. Um, so it, it's hard – for me to call the eighth ranked offense in the NFL bad, but everything's a sliding scale. It's expectations. The expectations were you should be better than third. So if you come in with expectations like defensively this year, they were terrible last year. So if you become the 16th ranked defense, that's a big improvement. If you go from three to eight, that's a, that's a downgrade. And so expectations are a big part of this and they change things drastically. Um, and Brian, somebody had to pay. I mean, that's just the way the NFL, it's interesting. The Eagles always think of themselves as a forward thinking organization, but they're very, you know, they're very similar to other teams when it comes to blame and when it comes to not reaching expectations. And their first thought is to, all right, we got to move on from somebody. Somebody's got to pay for this. And I don't agree with that, but they're like everybody else. They're not unique by any stretch of the imagination. They're like everybody else. And typically they don't want to be like everybody else. So my argument at times is show some patience Continuity is big in this league. Let a young co coach learn on the job. When you hire a young coach, if you don't think there's going to be hiccups, you're not, you're not being realistic. So once you make that hire, and this goes with Sean Desai as well, you better expect some hiccups or, or go hire a veteran coach day one. You know, if you don't want to deal with the growing pains. Well, and as I said it yesterday, I've said it often, not only on this program, but just in life, you need to be smart enough to know what you don't know. And my question is, you know, staying on this conversation. So prior to Jalen's breakout year, Nick's first year with Jalen Hurts, did Nick call all the plays for the offense? <clears throat> 
Um, he did when he uh, uh, at the start of the season. He gave up uh, play calling in season um, uh, for the Chargers game, um, which was week seven, week eight. I'd have to look up exactly. Um, so yeah, he he was calling the plays, and then he decided. And I give Nick a lot of credit for this. The job is too big to get bogged down. Um, and the, you know, you start missing other things in the game, in game management, when you're bogged down thinking about the next play call. So week week nine was when the Chargers game was. Um, and that's when the reins were handed off to Shane Steichen as the play caller. And the Eagles lost that game. They were three and six at the time, and that's when they took off. So a lot of people, you know, give Shane the credit for that. And Shane did a phenomenal job, and Shane was even better the next year. Um, and has, I think, a great feel for play calling. But anybody who listens to this show, Krause, I say it a million times, I'll say it a million more. People do not judge play calling. They judge play results. Um, that's just but, what it is. But the impact is there. The number, the the numbers are the numbers are real. The, the, the Jalen went up. The numbers went up. Then the numbers went down. So if Shane Steichen called the offense in totality under what was a Knicks game plan, I guess. And you take that philosophy, John, and you now apply that to Kellen Moore and ask Kellen Moore or give Kellen Moore Saquon Barkley, who's special, and the offense is loaded with weapons. Is Nick smart enough to know what he doesn't know and let Kellen Moore... Let Kellen Moore, who's had success as a coordinator, let him in totality run the offense start to finish. I don't know. I wish I knew. Um, I think he has been, and I don't I don't want to use the term ordered, but I think he's politically savvy enough to realize that if he didn't make a change at offensive coordinator, he wouldn't be the head coach of this football team. Um, so I think he can read a room, and that room includes, obviously, Jeffrey Laurie and nobody else. Um, so I think he's savvy enough to realize that even though maybe it wasn't mandated, he had to make the decision to change. Um, but I also know... He really believes in himself. Um, he really believes in his offense. And that probably is going to be the most interesting story of the 2024 Eagles season because nobody's perfect. You you look at Patrick Mahomes in Kansas City and Andy Reid, and they have had hiccups, especially in the post-Tyreek Hill era, similar to the fact that they fell in love with the big play, and all of a sudden teams are taking away the big play, and they've had pockets where they have looked poor on offense as they're trying to push the ball, or in their case, they had a big issue with drops the last season. Um, nothing's ever perfect in this league, and there are going to be hiccups with Kellen Moore and Kellen Moore's offense. Um, and when those happen, what happens? If I could answer that, we'd all know. But I, I find it very hard to believe that Nick Sirianni, I've gotten to know over the past couple of years, has, is going to be a shrinking violet and is going to just sit in the corner out of the way. Um it's the most interesting storyline of this season, how he meshes with Kellen Moore. And Nick's not Andy Reid. So Nick doesn't have the, the clout 
the credibility, the confidence, the ability to command, the ability to make decisions when those hiccups occur, or the ability to correct those just from a standpoint of his tenure in the league. Andy reads it. Andy reads well, yeah, it. I mean, Andy, Andy reads a different. Andy reads a different conversation. Yeah, I mean, Andy's a first ballot Hall of Famer. Yeah, maybe the best story. coach of the generation. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm not. But I'm saying, even Andy Reid struggles. That's kind of what I'm saying. So anybody who thinks the Eagles aren't going to struggle at times offensively, that's not realistic. Um, we're just talking about Shane Steichen. There's a lot of revisionist history. You know, they had bad games when Shane was here because everybody has bad games. Everybody from Andy Reid on down. Everybody. So to think there's not going to be any hiccups is unrealistic. It's impossible for that to happen. But when you have the best talent on offense from a skill position, when you have the best offensive line or one of the best offensive lines, the expectation would be that that offense and all of that talent, now with the addition of Saquon Barkley, would put that offense at now an even bigger level. So well, that's, that's uh, part of the problem. That's part of the problem because the expectations are going to be so out of whack. Um, uh, that that was part of the problem last year. Like people think this was a bad offense. I mean, you got to watch the other. You got to watch the rest of the league to make that assumption. And yeah, but John, talent always doesn't talent isn't talent the great equalizer when it comes down to actual play and execution and not, not, not what the play, not the play call, but the execution of the play. That's what people judge. That's what people judge it on. Well, yeah, they judge on the expectations and you said something interesting. Um, The Eagles have the best skill position group in the NFL. I don't, I don't think that's the case. A San Francisco, um, that would be number one in my book. Uh, the Eagles are certainly top five, uh, but there are other teams, even not good teams. You know, I just mentioned with Damo over the quarterback conversation. Um, Minnesota is not even a good team. They have Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, TJ Hawkinson, and Aaron Jones now. Um, the Cincinnati Bengals um, for years with Jamar Chase and, uh, T Higgins and, 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 and Boyd. And it was Joe Mixon. Um, and now I forget who they, they, they signed at running back, but they're big time. The chargers are a bad team that have had big time talent in, in previous years. Um, the assumption that the Eagles are the only team with, with playmakers is incorrect. Um, do they have one of the best skill position groups? Yes. I mean, it starts with San Francisco, and then everybody's arguing for second place, to be honest. I mean, they have Christian McCaffrey, Debo Samuel, George Kittle, Brandon Ayuk, and their third receiver um, was a hell of a lot better than Quez Watkins. So, I mean, they're they're the Eagles have very good skill position talent. Um but are they the best? No. Do people think they're the best in Philadelphia? Yes. And those expectations are daunting. Well, we t- listen, it's in the news. We talked about it yesterday. Devontae Smith, they want to get a deal done with Devontae Smith. He's not a top five receiver. He's a great number two receiver behind AJ Brown, right? Yeah, he's great, one, number two. great number two. So if what you just said is accurate regarding this offense, which includes the infusion of Saquon Barkley, 
then what is the Achilles heel on the offense if the way they're built, they aren't from a talent standpoint, the top offense in the league? Or or parallel, they're not. Well, I mean, I, 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 and by the way, I don't. I don't think it's an insult to say top five. I mean, that's I don't uh, that's still that's still very good. I just, but I I think there's this perception locally that they have better talent than everybody else, and that's just not the case, even when it comes to skill position. And San Francisco being the most notable example. I mean. Jennings, their third receiver, was making plays in the Super Bowl. I, I, the Eagles had Quez walking. Brandon Ayuk had a better season than Devontae Smith last year. Now, Debo was banged up. AJ it can can go with anybody. George Kittle, with all due respect, is better than Dallas Goddard. Christian McCaffrey, with all due respect, is better than uh, Saquon Barkley. Now, Jalen Hurts should have been better than Brock Purdy. He wasn't last season, um, and he needs to get better. So it all starts with the quarterback, number one. I'll step aside here in hour number two, year four of Bird 65. We'll get to a commercial break. On the other side of the uh, break, Bob Brookover will uh, join John McMullen. I'm sure they'll have some conversation about Saquon Barkley. Uh, in addition to some upcoming conversation for the draft. And don't forget, next week, we'll start right back here on Birds 365. We'll start to get everyone ready with our version, or not not my version, but John's version. Uh, and we'll have some, uh, we'll rotate some uh, people through the chair that will be able to bring some good perspective here on Birds 365. Back in a moment. Imagine for a moment that you went to work today and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was going to be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was going to be all right just by talking with Brian in my heart. I just knew everything was going to be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Champions on three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA and the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. And the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC <laughs> Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles.
Welcome back. Football Friday edition of Birds 365. And there's my buddy Bob Brookover making his Birds 365 debut a day late, by the way. I <laughs> screwed that up. I apologize, Brookie. My ego's too big. I assume everybody knows when my show is on. So I, I apologize. I see it on YouTube. So. Yeah. I, and, and, and people can watch it virtually. So anyway, thanks uh, for hopping on. I think it's a use, unique perspective. Obviously, Philadelphia sports fans know Brookie from years being at the Inquirer, covering the Eagles and Phillies uh, as well. But recently uh, for NJ.com, and he's back covering the Eagles, uh, you were up in North Jersey covering the New York Giants. So you have a n- unique perspective about one of the Eagles' top rivals. And I want to talk about the Giants a little bit as well from what they've been doing. But it's got to start with Saquon Barkley with Bob Brookover. And you've seen Saquon up close. I don't know anything who says anything bad about this kid. He's a great uh, teammate, evidently, great leader. I've got to meet him a very small portion when he was introduced here. Uh, seems like a class kid. Uh, obviously coming out of Penn State, enormous talent, number two overall pick. That rookie season was just unbelievable. And then it hasn't been that great. It it really hasn't, uh, Brookie. And there's been a lot of excuses um, uh, for Saquon Barkley in New York. And a lot of them are legitimate. Terrible offensive line, terrible quarterback play. But you know, transitional players tend to make something out of nothing. Uh, is he that type of player? Uh, certainly at this stage of his career. I I believe he is. I mean, you, you reference his rookie season, which was amazing, and he has not duplicated anything close to that. Although two seasons ago, he was he was the driving force behind the Giants going to the playoffs. I mean, he was thirty. 30 something percent of their offense. Uh he was the leader in that locker room. Uh, I was I was just so impressed by him in that season and I didn't get to see him nearly as much last season uh I, because he got hurt in the third game of the season or second game of the season. I'm sorry again the the, the, the very final series Giants going a game winning drive to beat the Cardinals it looks like okay maybe they got things straightened out and he gets hurt uh, the season goes in the tank. I was impressed from afar that he came back. Well, he, he, I was still there. He, he missed three games, and it was a high ankle sprain, uh, and he was back in three games. And he didn't have to come back because at that point, the team was a disaster. It was pretty clear they weren't going anywhere. They were 1-5, and five, I believe. And he said, no, that's not how I operate. I, I If I can play, I'm going to play. Uh, I'm not going to nurse this thing. Again, just a sign of a leader to me. I, from what I was being in that locker room for, I don't know, a year and a half and seeing what he meant in there, I, I'm really eager to see uh, what it's going to be like in the Eagles locker room because I do think he's one of those players that, um, you know, the moment he walks in the locker room, all eyes go to the, him and he can be an instant leader. I mean, maybe, maybe an example of that is Jordan Melato when he was asked last week about, Hey, you know, what did you think when Saquon, you heard that Saquon was coming to the Eagles? He's like, well, I was in a restaurant in Italy with my wife yeah, and, yeah. First, and she was like, what, what are you going on? And we got Saquon Barkley. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Right, Jordan, so. by the way, the F-bomb, the F-bomb is not uh, a rare occurrence with Jordan. He's trying it, to it, it is not, but <laughs> probably in an Italian restaurant when yeah. his wife has no idea what's going on, yeah. probably a little rare then. Now, to me, it's about the passing game because, uh, Brookie, the Eagles have been pretty successful running the football. Uh, you know, Miles Sanders turns into a Pro Bowl running back in uh, 2022. DeAndre Swift is a Pro Bowl running back last season behind this offensive line. So at some point, you, you start to think, well, how is what we think how he thinks about the running back position was turning out to be true. You can have success and cobble it together, especially with this offensive line, which loses Jason Kelsey, but still projects to be certainly top five in the league. So from that standpoint, Saquon Barkley should even be better running the football. And that 
that's a pretty high threshold because Miles averaged 4.9 yards per carry. Uh, DeAndre averaged 4.6. Those are numbers Saquon has reached once in his career, his rookie season. Now, again, supporting cast, that is a fair point of context to point in there. To me, though, and how he used the word special to describe Saquon, it's got to be about the passing game, right? Uh, get- I, I think in, I think in two respects that's true. Uh, one is, you know, he – go back and look at that rookie season, and I don't – he had 91 catches. I forget the exact number uh-huh. of yards, 700-something yards. He led the league in yards from scrimmage that year. So, obviously, that's in, within him. I, I saw it within him, uh, the game that comes to mind where he really – well, I mean, I, he scored a passing t- – receiving touchdown against the Eagles in that last game last season, which was a pretty clear indication that that's still in him. I remember the game against the Packers in London two years ago. The the, the, the Giants really exploited his ability to catch the ball in that game to beat the Packers in a game that nobody thought they could win. Um but I also believe, you know, and it's funny because early in his career, Saquon was accused of, by, of all people, Tiki Barber, of not being a very good pass blocker. It was a game against Pittsburgh in particular early uh, in his third or fourth season, I forget which year, where he, he didn't have a good game. The, the Giants got beat up on offense. And Saquon turned himself into a very good pass protector, uh, which is vital in this offense. And I'm not sure the Eagles were always very good at that out of the backfield, either DeAndre or um, um, Kenny Gainwell. Yeah. Right. And, and, and even going back to Miles Sanders, I think Barkley can help in that respect. But I even more so coming out of the backfield, being that threat on wheel routes and, and whatever, uh, you know, just short, short dump routes in the flat uh, that, that Jalen really needs to take advantage of more than he has in the past. Uh, I think we're going to see more of that with this offense. Um, I think people look at Saquon's age because he entered the league very young. Um, he's only 27. Um, and you say, well, there's plenty of, of tread left on the tire uh, for a 27. You don't that 30 word is a dirty word in the NFL when it comes to running back. So he's got some time before he hits that threshold. But I look at the touches, Brookie, and I say, huh? yeah, this guy's touched the football 1,500 times in the NFL about uh, uh, right on that cusp. And that's a lot of work. And that's, you know, post ACL, um, which he had, I think, in year three. Uh, and that's also a, a lot of those touches are on that MetLife turf, which, you know, is not very popular with players. and takes a toll on the body, I would imagine, uh, just from a wear and tear standpoint. Typically, and the Eagles went through this with DeMarco Murray, um, when you get all those touches and the 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 descent can, can start quickly, do you think the Eagles come into this saying, we're going to, we think this guy has a little bit less and we're going to run him into the ground? Uh, that ugly side of football, or do you think they think this is a multi-year type thing um, and we want to sort of manage this? Well, well, the way the contract is constructed, it's a two-year deal. I mean, they can get out of it after after two years pretty easily. No no guaranteed money in that third year. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're going to get at least two years out of Saquon. I can tell you, I did, did learn this, you know, Saquon wants the ball. You know, he's he's the feed me type of guy. Uh, so he's he's probably going to get it less because, you know, the, the Giants did not have outside receiver weapons. Darius Slayton's got his, was a speed guy, but not a consistent, you know, not an A.J. Brown or Devontae Smith type, a, a, a decent receiver, be a great third receiver. Uh, but, you know, he, he never after Odell Beckham left, he never had that with the Giants. There was never another guy who. uh you know, you said, oh, well, they might give it to him instead of Saquon in a, in a critical time. So he's going to not have to do as much. Uh, he's going to still want to do as much, if not more. Uh, and, and I'll, you know, I, you, you referenced Christian McCaffrey earlier and said Saquon's not Christian McCaffrey. But Christian McCaffrey went to the 49ers and he was a very good, you know, a, an outstanding back. One of the best in the league with the Carolina Panthers. 
But going to the 49ers and that talent around him unlocks something to another level beyond all the other running backs in the league. Now, will that happen for, for Saquon? I don't know. But Christian McCaffrey was 27 years old last year. Saquon Barkley is 27. Christian McCaffrey had been beat up and missed almost yeah, two, had, uh... two seasons. And th that's one thing I will say about Saquon. You know, he has this reputation of, of being a guy who is oft injured, but he's basically, except for the year where he tore his ACL in week two, he's basically averaged 15 games a year. Uh, you know, maybe that goes to the negative part of what you're saying about he's been, you know, he, he, a lot of tread on his tires. Uh, not much. I mean, not much tread left on his tires, but I don't I don't think so. I, I think it just goes more to the testament of this guy is ready to play when it's time to play. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, Christian has more touches than Saquon in his career. And you're right. Similar age wise. So maybe that does unlock something. I go back to that with with McCaffrey, though. I go back to the 2019 season in Carolina, where which was his last fully healthy season with the Panthers we weren't. They were decent because of him, but they weren't a great team. And that was the year he had 1,400 rushing yards, 15 touchdowns, 116 receptions. He was over 1,000 yards um, as a receiver uh, in the same year, 1,000 yards rushing, 1,000 yards receiving. So to me, he's a little bit different. The Eagles, by the way, Brookie, had tremendous interest in, in Christian McCaffrey in 2017, which I'm sure you're aware of. Sure. He's sort of been the white whale and they're trying to duplicate his presence. I just don't think there's a duplicate. And sometimes there is. I always argue one, one of the terms I hate as a writer is generational talent. We hear it so much. To me, once in a generation means once in a generation. And I think Christian's the one. And I think everybody else is fighting for two. But that's if, just if, my if, if you've got Christian light, is that pretty good? <laughs> Yeah, number Saquon, two's not. Saquon himself has said Christian's the best in the league. Yeah, um, but I, I've, another side of Saquon I got to see in New York was the competitive side, where Saquon, if, if he thinks Christian is the best, that's the that's the bar. He his bar is set at Christian McCaffrey, for who he wants to be. I mean, I saw my, my favorite story was um, the, the Giants had a receiver uh davis uh what his name is escaping me he was like their sixth seventh receiver um but he was the best player they brian dable in his first year brought a ping pong table and saquon stunk at the game this kid davis was the best best ping pong, uh, best ping -pong player by the end of the season he had he had Saquon ranked third in the third in the room he, he said he could barely yeah. play the game he said by the end of the season saquon wanted to be the best so bad that he was the third best in the room and he was able to he said he can't beat me yet but he he can compete with me now <laughs> so that's yeah I, hey uh, pat leonard told me a story about uh, it, uh i don't know they were arguing about who the better chess player was and they, and oh, they i was there for that the, yeah it broke out the chessboard yeah. and saquon beat pat so uh yeah. pat leonard but that, that's yeah a small, that's a low bar <laughs> yeah that's a that's a very low bar that's a very low bar now pat's a good guy but yeah, I've heard nothing but good things about Saquon Barkley from a, like I said, from a from a competitive standpoint, leadership standpoint type of guy. Um, I just, I look at it from the Eagles' perspective and the way they usually do business, and this is not the way they usually do business. So it, it sticks out to me and say, what's different? And if Howie's right, Howie's right. If he's special, all of a sudden it looks great. And we'll see how that strikes out. But before we get back to the Eagles, I do want to talk about the Giants with you, Brookie, because, boy, I got to tell you, they've been a disaster basically since Cherry Reese and Tom Coughlin. And I thought they they got it right early in the process with Brian Dayball and Joe Shane. I said, all right, Giants are starting to go in the right direction. And I don't know if I'm right now. Uh, you know, Dayball's fighting with coaches and assistants, and I don't get the plan. Uh, Joe Shane trying to build a roster. Where, where are you on the Giants and how things have progressed under under Brian and, and Joe Shane? Uh, you know, I thought he's a great question, but I thought I thought even recently, as the end of last year, you know, that team was two and eight when I stopped covering them. 
Um, and I was like, well, what a disaster this team is. They won three in a row with Tommy DeVito. They, they <laughs> finished with a, a win over the Eagles, uh, you know, and, you know, the, the Eagles were at least trying a little bit. Uh, they were a disaster at that point. They were a worse team than the Giants at that point. Uh, but I said, all right, all right, all right. And then all I start hearing all the stuff about uh, Wink Martindale, uh, you know, what happened, you know, yeah. I knew some people there, uh, just an absolute disaster. And then I, I wasn't aware of the Mike Kafka stuff. I thought they were pretty tight and when I left there. Um, but, you know, that's just does not bode well for, going forward uh now the question is does joe shane have the power and the wherewithal to stay if he decides brian dable you know he was obviously his guy he's the guy he brought with him from buffalo does is it a package deal in john mara's mind or would would they move on from dable and keep shane but shane's got to prove himself too i mean shane's you know he, he drafted a right tackle on evan neal who he's going into his third season here. And if it's as big a disaster as the first two have been, that's a major bust as a number seven overall pick uh, at a, at a, in an area where the giants are a disaster to begin with their offensive line is, as we talked about in referencing Saquon, just so, so bad. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, they had to bring back. And they've tried to fix it. I mean, they tried. Thomas is a good player. Thomas and is as you mentioned, player. Thomas, the, the giants some season last year, and I'll just, just not too many people on Eagles, uh, Berg's 365 want to hear about the Giants, but their first game of the season, I don't know if you, you're aware of this, but the, you know they go down the field, drive to like the four-yard line against the Cowboys, have to – a penalty, a false start penalty, I think it was might have been on Andrew Thomas, but you know forces them to try a field goal. The field goal is blocked, return for a touchdown. Andrew Thomas is hurt on the play, misses the next eight weeks of the season. Uh, the kicker was also hurt, by the way. He kept kicking for a while, but never recovered. <laughs> it was horrible. Uh, and that was just like – the Right there, that was that just defined the whole giant season. Uh, so yeah, they, Andrew Thomas is good. They try to fix it, but you know, they, they're just they things happened with that team last year when I was covering it that I just never seen before. I saw an offensive lineman cry in the locker room two straight weeks Ooh. because he had let his Ooh. team down. I mean, the, the first time vis visibly just weeping at his because he was so disappointed in himself. Um, I mean, it was That's Andre Dillard like. I don't uh, like it to was, hear that. It, yeah. it was just amazing, John. It really, it really was. Uh, and you know, so Joe Shane is to put it really on the clock now. And it's amazing how things have unfolded for the Giants that they're in this number six pick where they took Daniel Jones, um, who they thought had taken a step forward. They they committed to him. They can get out of that. But but now that here they are back with the number six pick, uh, and in quarterback. What do we do, mode? Um, yeah, because of everything in front of them, it's just fallen not exactly right for them. Um, I, I'm almost if I'm the Giants of the mind of you know, forget about the quarterback, take the best receiver because that's something I'm, I'm with you. I'd be scared and, to death, and, to and you know what? And, and after that, uh, you know, I did a mock draft the other day with one of those simulated mock drafts that I've become addicted to. And in that draft, I wasn't drafting for the Giants. The Giants traded down with the Vikings and ended up taking two defensive players. And I was like, you know, this isn't a bad idea. You, you build your defense, which is also already not too bad. Their best their best free agent move last year was getting Bobby O'Karake, uh, who was yeah, he's a good, good player. He's really good, player. good for them. Yeah. Uh, and all of a sudden, you build your defense. You got Brian Burns. You got Kayvon Thibodeau. You got Dexter Lawrence. You, you say, all right, we got our defense in place. Our offense needs work, but we're, we're going to win some games just because our defense is going to be so good. Um, and then, you know, next year, focus on the quarterback. Or, you know, and also, you get to see what Daniel Jones is for another year, yeah. the guy you signed anyway. So. I, I would almost have to, you know, you can't be scared, but boy, I'd be scared if I were the Giants to take JJ McCarthy or somebody like that and trade up uh, and have that kind of uncertainty. But we'll see how that shakes out. Now, you got back here and, and started covering the Eagles after that two and eight start. You saw one of the greatest collapses in Eagles history. Five, what, five, five and 14 for the year, John, was my record between the two teams and outscored by 224 points. And so when I, wasn't, I, when I wasn't covering the two teams, they were 12 and four. <laughs> <laughs> so now we know I've been, I've been talking on this show every day, Brookie, and said, I cannot explain 
this collapse. I really can't. And and, and now I can. My, me is the exp- as good an explanation yeah. as I've heard. Yeah. It, it it was amazing because and they lacked some style points during that 10 and 1 start, the Eagles I'm talking about. Um, but you know, if you look at the two year span, they were so good, obviously, in the Super Bowl season. They just found ways to win games. And all of a sudden, plus, boom, plus that's beat, over. They beat, the, they beat the Super Bowl champions in Kansas City. Yeah. I forget. And then a desperate Bills team the following week. With with Jalen Hurts being out of his mind good, I thought. Yeah. I go back to Sean Desai. And people say, uh, Sean Desai was a, a, a joke and this and that and whatever you want to describe. I think people forget, at least early in the season, there were some signs. Tampa Bay, week three, they were really good defensively. Second half against uh, the Rams after getting shredded, they were really good. They made some adjustments. Um, Miami, who was the most explosive team in football, they stopped them at the time. Uh, and then all of a sudden the wheels came off. But what what was most shocking to me, Brookie, so the Eagles were, I think, 8-1. and one. Um, I have to look it up at the bye week. Yep. But that's when they were thinking about changing defensive coordinators. Why in God's name? would you think about changing defensive coordinators when you're having, look, there were some issues, no doubt about it, but why, why would that even creep into your mind as a head coach? If you're Nick Sirianni? Yeah. I, I mean, and if you go back and, and Jeff McLean had the story later where they don't, I, I, I don't, I don't remember the exact week, but they had stripped him of his third down play calling duties. Uh, you know, you know, right in that same time, even before they took away the whole play calling duty from him. I mean, it was, it was insane in my mind. You ju- you just don't do that in the middle of the season. I, and you know, I what I came on the beat too late to know, you know, to be able to extract information from guys who might you know been more deeply entrenched. My my teammate Chris was more entrenched, but uh, you know, that that had to rub some guys the wrong way. Now you know, I've since heard people say, well, you know, that they, they weren't on board with the Uh but. I, I keep hearing the word presence, Bob. You didn't have a presence. Right. Like, all right. right. Well, uh, I mean, all right. That's, that's fine. To me, that's just a move you, you make after the season. You don't make it in the middle of the season. I, I, I think you just invite chaos and, and uh, disorganization when you, when you do something like that. I, I did not like to move at the time. I still don't like it. Uh, I'm fine that they've moved on since then. Um, you know, I think, Brian Johnson gets too much of the blame for what happened. Oh, yeah. uh, oh, yeah. You know, both coordinators got too much blame. You know, I, I, I don't know exactly what happened to that team. Something, you know, defensively, they probably just weren't, and I'm not sure this is the same case for the offense, but defensively, they probably just weren't talented enough. And eventually that, that came to bite them. You know, Slay goes down for the, for the three game period. That's a killer for them. Bradbury just lost his way entirely. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, if you look at players, the, you know, the linebackers started getting hurt and, you know, they weren't great linebackers to begin with, but they were playing pretty well. Morrow and uh, Zach Cunningham were playing pretty well. And then all of a sudden they're hurt and not playing. And now you're, you know, you're relying on guys that Ben Van Zimmerman. Ben have, Van Zimmerman, yeah. Have, right. Haven't even played, uh, you know, so – Defensively, that the especially the back end of that defense, and then on top of that, Jordan Davis doesn't starts not playing as well. Jalen Carter was lights out in the first half. He was still, I thought, okay. You know, I, I still think he had a great rookie season, but not quite as great. Uh, you know, the, the, the two edge rushers kind of disappear. You know, so I mean, if if I'm looking at why this team collapsed defensively, it, to me, it's just far more on the players than any coaching. You know, you can say, oh, the scheme was different. Oh, they had Reddick dropping in coverage and all that. Nah, right, but by the way, that's the most overblown thing. I, he dropped seven times against Arizona. That right. was his high point. And that's weird. Don't get me wrong. I wouldn't drop him seven times. But I think that was so overblown. At Brooke OB. Why is it at Brooke OB on X, by the way? It should be. <laughs> it goes back to my days at the Inquirer. And that was kind of our sign in at the Inquirer. Ah, oh, I got it you. Was your, there, that makes sense. Your last make, name, yeah. The start of your last name. Yes. Yes. 
Yes, so. that makes sense. So follow Bob on X, NJ.com. He mentioned with our buddy Chris Franklin, friend of the show, does a tremendous job. And before I let you go, I'll end it with those mock drafts you've been doing. Uh, you're addicted to them. So I want you to put on your Howie Roseman hat at uh, 22 overall. My personal opinion is he ain't picking at 22. He's going up. He might go down. He might even trade it for a player as he did with A.J. Brown. Um, what do you got? 22, Brookie, right now. Two weeks. We're just under two weeks to go. Well, I'm, I'm with you. What would make anyone think that Howie's going to pick at number 22? Um, I might move up for a guy like Quinion Mitchell. I love that. I love um, Quinion Mitchell. Yeah, I really think they need a cornerback. So let's let's just go with that. I think he's going to move up, maybe have to move up five or six spots, use maybe one of those second-round picks, number 53 overall, to do it, um, and, and and go get a cornerback. And if it's not him – I still think how he's going to use one of those second round picks to, to, to move up a little bit and, and get the guy he really wants. Could be an offensive lineman, which will excite everybody as usual. <laughs> uh, not, not sexy, but that's the foundational principle of the Philadelphia Eagles. Brookie, thank you so much. Um, you know, I'm going to call on you again. Uh, did a tremendous job. And I don't believe you were the bad luck for the New York Giants or the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, <laughs> But now I have an explanation to use. <laughs> you had to go more with those defensive guys. Yeah. And Jill. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, bud. All right. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, Brookie made a tremendous debut on Birds 365. We're going to tap into him now that he's back covering the Eagles for many years, doing great work at the Inquirer. Uh, and we're going to put uh, an end to the week. I don't want to say Bo on the show as deference to Jody McDonald, but more Birds 365 after the break. Imagine for a moment that you went to work today and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was going to be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was going to be all right just by talking with Brian in my heart. I just knew everything was going to be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Champions on three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA. And the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Do you 
stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV, now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. For the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. Just a few minutes remaining on this week's Football Friday edition of Birds 365. Good conversation, Johnny Mack, with Bob Brookover. I learned, I guess, that Saquon Barkley likes to get the football. So I wonder what that means in this offense with all these guys on the team that love to get the football. Excited now, I think, that Saquon's going to Kellen Moore, yeah, that's yeah. Kellen Moore's good problem. So he's yeah. got to figure it out. That's uh, He's got to make everybody happy. We know AJ wants the football. Uh, Devontae wants the football, even though he's a little bit more understated. Dallas wants the football. Um, everybody wants the football, Krause. It tells me, John, that just by the mere presence of that special player, Saquon Barkley, that that will balance out or at least adjust the desire for the big play. And it will kind of refocus the offense a little bit more on the early possession downs in the series. Yeah, hopefully. I'll tell you what impresses me the most, because I get a lot of criticism, because I question the Saquon Barkley move simply because it's not typically the way the Eagles do business. But the thing I'm most impressed with, anybody who knows the guy, anybody who's been around the guy, only has glowing things to say about mm-hmm. him. That is a positive to me. Um, because, to be honest, I think people bend over backwards to make excuses for him. And that they do that because they like him. And that's a good thing. When people are drawn to you and... um. He, he he's that type of person he's everybody likes him everybody and you kind of saw it with brookie just you know the giants have been what the giants have been and he had two good seasons and you know if you're looking at it just purely um objectively them taking him number two overall was not a good move but you can't find anybody to say that who's been around the Giants. Birds 365 next week. We'll dive more. Johnny Mack, rather. We'll dive more uh, into the NFL draft. You'll re- Next week, you reach the runway uh, leading into the following uh, Thursday. I guess it's all been set and determined how he's not going to pick it. Take a pick at number 22. Uh, well, I think if you're gonna, playing the odds, he's not. Yeah, and that's he's going to go. History. And he should or possibly will shore up the one area of the defense that is old and can shore up, and that would be the cornerback position. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think that would be a logical way to go. I like Quinion Mitchell um, a lot, as 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 Brookie does. That doesn't mean the Eagles do. Uh, but but Howie's recent history will be there will be a, a cloud of players, um, three or four players, maybe as many as five, that he hopes will be there at 22. And as they start to come off the board, if the one's left, He'll go up to get him, or he'll try to go up to get him. Um, I don't think – I think this is a year where he should consider moving back. I really do. Um, maybe add a little bit more uh, as far as draft capital, maybe try to get back in the third round at some point. Um, and, you know, hey, you want – uh, out of character with Saquon Barkley, why not go out of character with an interior offensive lineman at 31, 32, go to the bottom of the first round. Graham Barton's a player that I love, that I think would fit, that I think would be a day one starter. And you're talking about the offense and the offense. 
to live up to their expectations. Skilled people can't do anything without the offensive line. And the offensive line is still going to be good because you have Lane Johnson, Jordan Mylotta, and Landon Dickerson. But you do have to replace Jason Kelsey, and that's tremendous pressure on Cam Jurgens. And you have to replace mm-hmm. Cam Jurgens at right guard. And there's no to assume Tyler Steen's going to do that. That might be a little bit pie in the sky. Might be the Achilles heel on the um, most explosive offense in the National Football League, or one of the top five uh, best offenses in the National uh, Football League. That brings us to a close here on Birds 365. Johnny Mack enjoyed the uh, last couple of days listening to uh, your insight. Um, a good football Friday today. Special thanks to Dom and, of course, Bob Brookover. First appearance for Bob on uh, Birds 365? Yeah, number one. Um, so we'll get Bob on more now that he's back covering the Eagles. He was covering the Giants uh, many years at the Inquirer. People, uh, long-term, long-time Philly sports fans uh, probably remember Brookie. But he's back in the fold uh, covering the Eagles on a daily basis. So we'll, we'll try to get him uh, more. Uh, moving right. forward. Good stuff from uh, Johnny Mack. Thanks to you. Thanks to uh, all of uh, everybody participating uh, in the chat. And of course, watching us live here on the Jacob Sports uh, YouTube channel. Your continued uh, support for uh, this show now in its fourth year, Birds 365, and for many part of their uh, morning routine. Uh, of course, Xander for producing the show today. I'm Joe Kraus. See you next time, everybody. You've been listening to Birds 365, the destination for the passionate Eagles football fan who bleeds green. If it's Eagles football, we're talking about it. Debate inside the locker room and guests that are some of the greatest football minds from around the region. We hope you enjoyed the show. We know we had a blast. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hook up with us on social media at Jacob Sports. See you next time on Birds 365.